Hello, everybody out there on the interweb. I mean, it's a strong day. It's interesting. It's tiring. It is exhausting, I guess, for you watching with all this content, but also for us here on the on the hosting team, on the technical team in the background, the organization team in the background. So far, it has been an awesome roller coaster and a fantastic ride. And Aditya, tell me. What was your, are you still on the previous session about uh, one of our partners coming to Mauritius and offering more AWS services? Exactly, yeah. So AWS, well, it's one of the most popular uh, cloud services uh, in the world, but the, its presence in Mauritius has been quite limiting. Uh, seeing new companies bringing AWS technologies here, cloud mm -hmm. fraud and CI, CD, all that. I mean, it's really exciting. And, uh, it can provide new opportunities for startups or companies here. Yeah. I mean, going into the cloud sounds great. Everything seems to yeah. be, uh, you know, cloudy. <laughs> but there is always this kind of security aspect. And uh, with this, I would like to introduce our next guest, um, Stefania Chaplin. She is connected to us from summer sunny London. Welcome, Stefania. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great, thank you. If you're right, there's actually a bit of sunshine in the UK, so maybe it is still summer here. <laughs> it, 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 it's like this one week in the calendar. <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. It's September, Indian summer, exactly. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I see that you got quite some um, records and activities in your bio. That seems absolutely awesome. Uh, I let you to it. Um, Aditya, what, what is it that is going to be of interest now for you on this session? Well, uh, I would really like to see how Dev, DevOps and DevSecOps, all that uh, combines or wh how things goes eventually. Uh, first, Stefania has really good background. I, I'm saying you have from her by you. Really exciting ride. So we'll see uh, what there is what there is to see. Uh, I'll leave the floor to Stefania to, to introduce herself and start her. Thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Um, so yes, my name is Stefania Chaplin. I'm a solutions architect at Secure Code Warrior. And today I'm going to be talking about Dev to DevSec. Why security aware developers are the new rock stars. So a little bit about my agenda for today. I'm going to talk a little bit about who am I and a little bit about my background. Um, some high profile infinite incidents. And then I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to go way, way back in time. I say back in, back in time, maybe, you know, 30, 40 years, but the ancient history of software creation and looking at different methodologies, waterfall, agile, DevOps, and then moving to DevSecOps because security is obviously very, very important. Um, and ultimately why security aware developers are the future. And finally, I'm going to provide some top tips. I've got a tactical guide to uh, transforming from dev to DevSec. And then finally, Q&A. So, who am I? Um, I started my life as a Java developer, and then I moved over. I worked in a startup as a lead Python developer. I also have a little bit of C experience from uni, but we don't talk about that. But um, my, my strengths are very much in back-end development. I, even, I had to learn some JavaScript recently, and although I could do it, it, it was not my forte. But anyway, moving on. Um, after being a developer for a while, I moved into the world of DevSecOps. So I'm going to be covering it, but for those that don't know, everyone talks about DevOps, which is development and operation, but you know, where is security? Uh, I worked for a company called Sonotype that does software composition analysis, so focusing on open source software. So for example, if you're developing in, say, Java, or maybe in Python or um, you know JavaScript. If you're using open source softwares, even the main frameworks like Struts, Django, um, Angular, Node, they're going to come from a public repository such as Maven Central, PyPy, or NPM. And obviously, when you've got you know publicly hosted components, um, I'm sure when they are uploaded, they're they're good. Sometimes they're not even good at that stage, but things go bad quite quickly. So it's a very big area, software composition analysis, and it gave me great scope about the whole DevSecOps um, arena. And I moved to Secure Code Warrior, so I've been here almost a year, 
joined about Christmas, December last year. Um, and whilst in DevOps, we talk about shifting left. You know, it's cheaper to fix a bug within the IDE than in production. I'm sure many on the, on the um, call can kind of empathize. With um, Secure Code Warrior, it's very much about start left, but I'm not here to talk about Secure Code Warrior. I'm here to talk about DevSec. So, talking talking about DevSecOps and what you mentioned yeah. in regards to Sonar type, uh, did you actually see that we had um, Ilka Turunen yeah, yesterday so, on the chat? So he was my old manager. So, um, so yes, I I was in Sonar type in his team. Um, you know, uh, also covering kind of Europe. Um, so yes, I did see that he was there. It's nice to see a friendly face. It's fantastic. Please. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a couple of hacks um, that have happened, some high profile incidents. Maybe people have heard of one of them. Maybe you've heard of all of them, but just talking through some of the stats. So the main thing is what do these incidents have in common? Because they've got one other than obviously being a hack, they've got a, a common theme about them. So the Panama Papers, so um, this happened um, a few years ago, I think it's about 2015, and there were 11.5 million internal documents, uh, which included nearly 40 years of data. So it was from 1977 to the end of 2015, um, and it included a lot of offshore jurisdictions, um, and it affected a lot of companies. And this was just based on a fairly simple um, SQL injection. SQL has been around since 1998, so is the fix. So this was obviously quite a big deal, and you can imagine when it comes to offshore jurisdictions and you know, um, you know, paper, papers, shall we say? There was probably some very sensitive information. And 2.7 terabytes is obviously uh, not to be sniffed at. Uh, some on the call may know um, Steam. So that's for um, video games, streaming video games. I use it, um, you know, if anyone out there goes on Reddit, there's a lot about Steam. And they actually had a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So this was in about 2017. And uh, one of the initial answers from the Steam management, you know, in the, in the I say the tech department, I hope it was the, you know, support rather than full on tech, but oh, 128 characters is too short to do anything bad. Uh, well, um, reading around this, you can do a lot of things with 128 characters. So, you know, simple things, redirecting a user to a website to fish that login. You can utilize some CSS trickery, so that's kind of in the front end, to change your profile to trick users. Um, obviously, Steam, it's for video games. People buy things, so you can actually drain your Steam wallet funds. And you can also spread malware via an auto download. So um, although this was a few years ago and it got fixed, it always worries me when someone says, oh, 128 characters or whatever is too short because that's almost like an invitation for hackers. Um, I don't have a slide on this, but anyone who knows about the T-Mobile hack, where they were, I believe, storing their passwords um, in, in plain text, and someone in the social media department, I think it was in Austria, I think, uh, replied, our security is actually really strong. And then the next day, T-Mobile was down. Because if you're going to be tweeting that your security is strong, that is literally an invitation to be hacked. Um, IRS, so this was in America. This was um, South Carolina. About 3.6 million tax returns uh, from about 1998 to 2012 were, um, were stolen. And at that point, this was the largest cyber attack against a state tax agency in the nation. Um, and as well as all these social security numbers, there were almost 400,000 credit card details as well. So, you know, whether you're a, you know, offshore jurisdiction, video games, government, you know, no one is safe. Um, and even Tesla, and you know, I'm sure people know of Tesla and all the amazing things they're doing, not only the cars, but you know, SpaceX, etc. So they had a bit of a problem. Their cloud resources were hacked to run a cryptocurrency miner, uh, mining malware. And this was because of put, put, ugh, poorly secured access credentials. Um, and it actually happened, it was in Kubernetes, so that's for uh, Docker orchestration. And there was one pod um, that had an unsecured administrative co uh, console um, and it exposed access credentials, which could then be used to access an S3 bucket that had sensitive data in it. 
Um, and then finally, this is probably the most famous, um, Equifax. And this was in 2017. And this kind of really uh, started to change a few things just because of the sheer size. If you think back a moment ago, I spoke about IRS was 3 million. Equifax was 147 million. Um, I used to talk about Equifax a lot when I was at Sonotype and I used to talk internationally. So it's a bit like, you know, the population of France and Germany put together. It's like 14 Swedens, um, it's like two and a half UKs. So it was obviously a huge amount of people and it was stuff like name, social security number, birthday, address, driving license numbers, and these kind of things. It's not that easy to change all of them. So immediately after you saw a huge uptick in fraud cases, because if you have someone's name, social security, birthday, address, driving license, etc. You can then start to take out massive loans on their behalf and, you know, um, insurance fraud, identity fraud, etc. Um, and like I said, all of these incidents, as you can see, totally different, um, you know, industries, attack vectors, um, all of this, they all had something in common. Um, and one of, and the thing uh, that kind of surprises me is OWASP web top 10. So, um, for those on the call that don't know, OWASP is ugh, Open, Open Web Application Security Program and it's, um, it's kind of an industry standard for application security. And as well as web, you've also got mobile, you've got API. But when I'm looking through uh, the hacks I mentioned, so Panama, that was injection, that was A1. And like I said, SQL has been around forever. Uh, Steam, cross-site scripting, A7. Um, IRS, that was uh, broken access control, A5. Some people say it's A2 broken authentication. They can be, they can, there can be some overlap. Um, but anyway, uh, what happened to Tesla? Well, for one, security misconfiguration, their Kubernetes was, um, you know, um, unsecured, but also they had their access credentials showing, so that would be broken authentication. And finally, Equifax. They were using a vulnerable version of struts, so using components with known vulnerabilities, and it was also a deserialization issue. So the thing about OWASP, this is a very well-known framework. Um, I'm sure if you speak within your organization, whether it's higher up or lower down, most people will know about some of the types of vulnerabilities or may have heard of this. And if I go back, uh, all of these companies, um, they obviously got exploited. So it kind of shows a bit of a mismatch between, you know, here are our standards, but unfortunately we're still getting breached. So in order to talk about all this, it's worth kind of going back in time a bit. So I say back in time. Um, let's start off in 1986, um, W. Edward Deeming, um, who wrote a book, Out of the Crisis. And he spent, he's a bit of a, um, you know, he's a, he's a very well-known figure for what he did with manufacturing. So he worked a lot in Japan uh, with kind of to uh, Toyota, looking at why the Japan cars were so good and in reflection, why, you know, Ford was um, so bad, um, you know, in the period of kind of the 60s, 60s, 70s, etc. And one of the key um, differences was looking at quality. And when we talk about uh, car manufacturing, we can say, um, you know, the, the physical parts that are used, whether it's your steering wheel or exhaust pipe, or I don't know that much about cars, so I'm pretty much out now. Um, and when you look at, when you translate it directly to uh, software development, then you can start to look at your, you know, open source components, uh, your method calls, your, your parameters, etc. So quality is, you know, very, very important. And one of my favorite qu quotes uh, by him was, quality is everyone's responsibility. So it's not um, in, so you know, in software, it's not just the developers. You know, it's not just the security team. It's not just the product owner. It's not just the CISO or the CEO that when everything is running late, they just close their eyes, you know, sign, sign a bill that allows um, tools out, you know, with uh, known defects, which you hope doesn't happen. But when everything's over budget, it's, it's a painful time to be in. And what you end up with is these silos. So between development and security. Um, and they even speak different languages. So developer, you're going to be talking about constructors, about classes, about methods and parameters and, and the new and shiny and, oh, you know, infrastructure as code and all the, all the fun stuff. While security, they will be, you know, security, I hope, should know my slide from before, oh, what's one to ten? That they, they will know what that means. And if you start talking to a developer about, you know, um, say, um, you know, broken authorization, or authorization issues, the developer might scratch their heads and when 
And if you were to translate, it's like, don't write a method saying password is wrong, because then the hacker knows that the username is right. And the dev are like, ah, oh, that makes sense. Security, we call that username enumeration. So uh, there's these kind of silos. People sit in different teams, in different areas of the building, uh, now in obviously different remote offices. And they speak different languages. So it can be quite hard to combine them into the dev. And the problem we have is the old bugs are performing new um, new tricks, or, or really what it means to say is, um, you know, like I mentioned, SQL injection has been around forever, and so has the fix. Um, so it kind of implies a disconnect. You know, we keep having the same bugs, the same problems, the same things failing our builds, the same uh, red flags in our AppSec testing tools, SAST, DAST, pen testing, etc. So why don't we, you know, shift left, you know, maybe even start left in terms of thinking about security, not just being security's responsibility, but empowering our developers. And the thing is, with the current way we're going, you know, a few stats, 111 billion lines of code a year, zero day cyber attacks are estimated to reach one per day by 2021. Uh, for reference, Equifax was, I think, a two day, I think it was a two or three day window. Unfortunately, they didn't notice for a few months, um, which is why the hack was so big. But zero day cyber attacks, unless you're automating, you know, how are you going to maintain control of your, you know, software state um, if you don't have automated processes to remediate um, either components or the code itself? And part of the problem for this is the demand for security personnel far outweighs supply. And I will talk about that a bit more in a few slides. So looking at different methodologies, um, hopefully some of these will seem familiar. Um, waterfall are uh, the good old days in the 1970s when this came out. I, I'm not going to pretend I was alive, but I, I have learned quite a lot about this at uni. Um, and the way that I, I kind of like to think or explain this um, is, OK, be, being a child of the 90s, I remember Windows 95 and then Windows 98 and Windows 2000 and similar with the Microsoft Office. And with these, you know, big projects, you're going to have a waterfall cycle that is, you know, optimistically maybe six months, but more likely to be a few years. And the problem is, is that if there's a problem, say there's a problem, oh, we designed it wrong, or there's a problem in testing, or oh, there's a problem in production, as water implies, um, waterfall or water flows down. So if there's a problem in testing, to then go all the way back up and then rechange, that's going to be very expensive because it tends to be a, I've done my bit and then we pass on to the next team other than being more um, you know, um, kind of agile and kind of related to each other. Um, and then now you look at the good day, well, the current days, and you've got, instead of Microsoft releasing every few years, it's now Office 365, uh, which is awesome. Um, and part of the, um, one of the changes was the um, creation of Agile, which came around, I think it was about 2001. And if you look at Agile, Agile is not a series of tools. Like we talk about sprints and Kanban boards and like Scrum and all this. The Agile Manifesto is actually about culture. So it's literally saying people, not tools. Um, it's all about uh, kind of cross communication. You know, it's, it's it's a bit like if you look on if you look online, they've got a, a background with a you know a, a painting on it. It's almost like let's you know sing and bayar to each other. But it's very much about working in teams, small teams having small sprints. So for example, if you were doing a, a mobile app, sprint one, let's do the login page. Sprint two, let's link it to the back end. Sprint three maybe write the about us or whatever it is. And the advantage of this is you can get, especially um, if you want to get user feedback, um, you can literally do your user page and then um, um, you know, ask for feedback. Whilst in the waterfall, you could get to the end. It's like, oh no, we, we don't like that anymore. So, so that obviously has big repercussions. And then came along DevOps. So if anyone on the call hasn't read the Phoenix Project, I would strongly recommend it. I actually spent a few years where people said you should read it and I never got around to it. And then I actually read it during coronavirus, during lockdown. It's so good. So yeah, I would recommend because it's not a it's not a textbook. It's taking the lessons of DevOps and explaining it in a real life scenario. You, you follow the, you know, you follow the life of a guy in IT ops and, you know, a couple of things going wrong and his interactions with the dev team, the ops team, the security team. And it's really, it really helps to frame the problem and also the solution. FYI, I don't work on commission for the Phoenix project, but um, it just really helped me. And what you start to see is you've got your kind of development in the blue on the left and then your ops kind of on the right. And 
you know, larger companies that have implemented this. So I think it was about 2008, someone, I can't remember who the person was, but they went to a conference and they were like 10 deploys a day. And it was like, whoa, that's crazy. Oh my God, 10 deploys a day, you must be mad. Um, and then now we hear stats from, you know, the Amazons, the Netflix, Googles, Facebook, where it can be stuff like a deploy every 12 seconds. And the only way this is, um, you know, available is kind of having a, a continuous um, automation, whether it's CI, CD, etc. But there starts to be a problem with, you know, just plain DevOps. Um, and that is security, because if you think, if you're deploying to production every 12 seconds, what happens if you've got a bug? It's like, oh yeah, we hard-coded the admin password in. Obviously, that's not a good mistake to have. But um, you end up with this magical unicorn, obviously, you know, producing all of this, uh, all these rainbows, and then security have to come and clear it up, because as mentioned, security are really outnumbered, and DevOps and, and development are so focused on features and products and being ahead of the curve, etc. cetera, um, that then security um, obviously finds itself in an unfavorable position. Um, well, and then we enter DevSecOps. So uh, what you can see here, it's not about, you know, putting sec, you know, right in the middle, like a line down. It's about having security at each stage of the process. Um, and which makes a little bit more sense kind of on this slide. So you want to have, you know, at the beginning when you're planning, let's do threat modeling, let's figure out some policies. When you write the code, you want to have static analysis. You need to, when you're building, you might be doing your SAS, your software composition analysis, pen testing. And that's just within development. When you get over to ops, obviously logging, that's very important. Sounds boring, but especially if you get breached, you want to know who's done what and, and, you know, look through the log trails. And similarly, what, you know, this is very key for, you know, if and when you do get hacked, which is kind of inevitable, you know, it's all, it's almost like all manual processes are doomed to fail. It's also eventually you will get hacked. You know, no one is safe. Um, but anyway, that's where our incidents response teams come in, where they're able to detect response, you know, recover, you know, act on if there's any uh, nefarious kind of um, entrance or content or anything going on. So DevSecOps is not about, you know, one tool or one stage. It's really about having security um, throughout, uh, the pipe, uh, throughout the pipeline. Um, and then what do you end up with? A happy relationship, security nirvana between DevOps and security. Um, how is DevSecOps changing the game? It's obviously uh, quite different from, say, Waterfall, where security, I'm sure, was just another one of those block steps. And now we're having to have security everywhere. So where do vulnerabilities come from? I'm sure it's another little stalk in the sky. Um, vulnerabilities tend to come from uh, coding. That is where they are introduced. So one would suggest that's a good area to focus. And that's not to say let's all blame the developers, because sometimes you know it's not necessarily their fault. I'm sure that everyone's under time pressure. They want to, you know, stay ahead of competitors. They're just doing what everyone else is doing. You know, I, I'm sure every uh, company or everyone on the call has some idea of legacy and technical debt. You know, the, the, the directory no one wants to go into. It still works, but you know, we, we can't um, afford to update it at this moment. Um, so maybe, you know, focusing on developers and, you know, there's carrot and stick approaches, obviously telling them off, which isn't at all productive, um, but also training them, um, maybe giving them the information, explain to them what an SQL injection is. It's like, FYI, if you just parameterized your query instead of concatenating your input, you would, you would fix it. And guess what? You, your Jenkins would, um, or your Jenkins or whatever CI you're using, you wouldn't have any build fails and maybe you could go home on a Friday at 4 p.m. Ah, oh, the dream. Um, so when we start to think about that, you know, focusing where are the vulnerabilities introduced, you start to add these kind of two new stages to your DevSecOps, and that's about training and then assessing developers. Because um, when we talk about shift left in, in general in DevSecOps, it's kind of like, well, it's easier, instead of fixing something in production, hmm, why don't we fix it in CI? You know, let's do some testing tools there. It's like, oh, instead of fixing it, you know, waiting for the build to fail, why don't we fix it in the IDE and have, you know, a real time kind of, um, you know, plugins that developers can use. And then I think of it a bit like Inception. And it's like, oh, instead of fixing it in the IDE, why don't we go into developers' brains, train them on these secure coding principles, hopefully in an engaging way, because no one really likes, you know, hours of PowerPoint. Um, and then they can learn how to write secure code and not introduce the vulnerabilities. So everyone has a better time. Uh, SAS tools, less read, 
CI, Les Fails, and pen testers, maybe they can go home at Friday on a four o'clock as well. So um, it's kind of a it's a self fulfilling circle in that sense. And I've kind of touched on this a bit in terms of the cost of fixed security bucks. There's different research um, in different places. My favorite one is the IBM one, which says it's a hundred times more um, it's a hundred times more expensive to fix something in production than say in the kind of ID. And what you get is this, you know, quite you know healthy triangle. Um, and it's like I mentioned, um, cheaper. Uh, uh, oh, whoops! As far the more you go left, the cheaper it becomes. So maybe looking into developers' brains, as I mentioned. And we can talk about this. And I've kind of mentioned a few types of testing tools, um, you know, um, um, platforms that are out there. But ultimately, it's not about adding more and more testing tools. It's about changing culture is key. And that can come from a lot of places. You know, ideally, well, top down is great because then if you have someone in the C-suite, someone who's pro security, who gets behind these projects uh, and then it filters down, that's amazing. Um, you can also have bottom down developers that care about security and I'm gonna come to that in just a minute. Um, or ideally you kind of want both as well. Um, because the thing is, um, culture shapes values and attitudes and that uh, changes outputs or you know outcomes or what we do and similarly um, it kind of goes uh, both ways so it's not just about adding more SaaS tools that's not what uh, you know I'm talking about it's about um, changing culture and I'm going to come to that with some of my nice top tips so if you look at it as security is everyone's responsibility then developer security we can resolve security issues together so it's no longer about you know not wanting to show my app to security, you know, my ugly baby, because they might uh, tell me off for all of my different, um, you know, uh, vulnerabilities, etc. So, enter the security aware developers, the new kind of rock star, and I'm sure that's probably why most people are on the call to find out about this. So, um, a couple of stats. Um, there will never be enough AppSec people to save the day. So uh, a stat that we use often is one AppSec to 100 software developers. Personally, from my experience um, working in the field, traveling all over kind of, um, you know, EMEA, uh, that's very optimistic. Um, so I've been, in, um, I've been in organizations just to go visit, say hi, and it's been one to 300 or one to 200 is, is more common. Once I was on a video call and it was two to 150 and I gave them a little round of applause. I'm like, wow, you must really take security seriously. I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, but the point is that there will never be enough. So how can you change this? So enter the security champion. And these people are great because usually they're quite, they, they, they make themselves easier to identify because they are either very passionate or very paranoid about security. And the great thing about security champions, they're usually the developers that have an interest. They might understand the security jargon. Like if it's like, oh yeah, broken access control. Okay, let's just not make everyone admin. That's, that's kind of what it, what it means loosely. Um, so these are great resources and you can usually uncover them. You can um, you know, have programs, you can literally send an email to your developer like, is anyone interested in, in being in our security champions? And these can be a great um, you know, channel to start empowering developers to uh, kind of be more um, interested in security and, and, and kind of help to save the day. But on, obviously, why stop there? Empower all developers. Imagine if all developers knew about SQL injections other than, I say, the poor, the poor security champion who every Friday has to tell half the team, uh, you, you, you needed to parameterize your query, same issue as last week, etc. So, you know, why why stop at security champions? If you've got, you know, 100 or 300 to one AppSec, why not teach the developers about security? Um, you know, security can be a really, really intimidating topic for developers because it is a, it is a new language set and often, when you're talking about security, it's often because you're in trouble for having introduced bugs. Um, I speak from experience uh, from being a developer, but why not put a positive spin on security? Why not make it fun? Why not make it gamified and kind of engaging? And and instead of being you know carrot stick, instead of you know being very much on the stick side, you know make it a carrot. Have incentives, um, you know, and because ultimately everyone ends up in a better place 
if all developers uh, you know empowered and know about security guess what that little curve curve I showed you that the developers uh, would go way down um, the builds aren't failing we leave at four o'clock on a Friday and we don't have as many you know AppSec red notifications blaring at us so a tactical guide um, so I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about a few kind of top tips so Security is a shared responsibility, and I did um, talk about this a bit before. Um, and honestly, um, we mentioned the kind of the one to a hundred, but the DevSec mindset, it takes a village to uphold security best practice because there's, you know, I focus predominantly on AppSec, uh, there's, you know, environmental, there's uh, networking, especially with the, the move to everyone being remote, all of a sudden phishing. Uh, became a much bigger thing, um, which, you know, it had kind of died down a bit. You know, everyone has, you know, super duper WAPs and we're all controlled in our in our office HQ. And oh, now we're just tethering off our mobile, you know, at home. Um, so, you know, security is always changing. And so it does kind of uphold a village. And the security aware developers will adjust. So instead of just being fo focused on features, it's like, let's have high quality. Let's focus on security. Um, and actually, it's a lot more productive. It's like, okay, I could write, take three hours to write this, um, you know, to write this, um, let's just call it like a class or a, or a method. If you can write an app in three hours, that's very impressive. But, um, or I can take three, three hours, three hours and 15, three and a half hours, and then it's safe. Like take that little bit longer because ultimately, it takes three hours, it fails two weeks later, and then I have to go back and I spend an hour not only remembering what I did, finding out the problem, fixing it, etc. And developers, um, you know, well, everyone really can take ownership of their own coding outcomes and so keep security at the front of mind from the beginning. Um, and this is another one. So when we talked about security and developer being silos, so help nurture highly supportive environment. So it's no longer, you know, the, the bad people of security coming and failing the builds because um, I don't think security want to be the bad guys. You know, no one wants to be the bad guys and developers don't want to be in trouble. So there's a couple of things you can do. So KPIs are really helpful. So ensure that KPIs are positioned around secure code, not speed of production. So instead of, you know, having sprints based on apps, why don't you have, um, you know, app speed? Um, you could have, or, you know, number of lines of code, although number of lines is actually a bad one. But anyway, um, having KPIs around secure code um, and you can also, there are examples of this, you know, having worked in a few companies and, you know, trawling around the Slack channel, it, is, it does always interest to me when you get developers calling each other out, like, you know, hey, Bob, uh, you just introduced three new vulnerabilities with your latest commit. Are you going to fix that? Um, so it's, you know, it's very much about um, having different KPIs around security and quality. Um, you can also, um, you know, raise any gaps. So whether it's kind of knowledge, training, tools um, that would help um, either side of the kind of or any of the sides of the DevSecOps teams, whether that's security, whether it's development or ops as well. And you can also commit to a higher standard of security and set an example for others. A lot of the time, I, you know, when I speak to uh, communities about this, um, some of the time it is just the security champion to be. Maybe it's a developer within an org and they're like, hmm, I want to be better. I want to, I want to, I want to leave at five, four o'clock on a Friday. I hope that's not the only incentive, but you know, I don't want to introduce vulnerabilities, um, especially with say stuff like IOT. It always alarms me when pacemakers can call into hospitals if they go wrong. It's like, ah, oh, so who secured the, pe uh, the pacemaker so it can't be wirelessly hacked? And then there tends to be silence. Um, but anyway, you can commit to a higher standard for yourself within your remit and which sets an example for others. And then obviously work positively with other departments because ultimately you have the same goals. It's not about failing and about, um, you know, doing things wrong. It's about let's, you know, let's be the best company we can be. We want to get our apps out, but we want to do it securely. We don't want to be, you know, hard coding API keys and then uh, having no authorization and then having that go across the networking, you know, uh, et cetera. Um, and this is the thing, success ultimately, it depends on support. So it's everyone, it's not just DevSecOps, it's also um, you know, the support team, it's senior management having an understanding. It's like, okay, we're gonna take a bit longer to write this app, but we're gonna do it right first time so we don't have to keep rolling back features and production. 
Uh, and having all this can have a really um, positive cultural impact. And this is the thing, um, there's new things coming out every day. So I've mentioned, you know, new languages, new frameworks, new tools, um, new attack vectors. Um, if you think back, what, maybe 15 years ago, I don't think an iPhone even existed. And then if you look now at um, me, for example, personally, I do about 80 to 90 percent of my shopping online just via mobile because I'm normally out and about. Sometimes you get good discounts as well. But the whole mobile space, that wasn't even a thing, um, you know, say even 10 years ago. And now it's obviously huge. So it's really important um, to train. And this can be on kind of a number of things. So obviously security, frequent security training that is relevant to their job and up to date. So I talked a bit about, you know, mobile. Say if you've got your Swift and your Kotlin team, there is no point in teaching them about uh, Java Spring and vice versa. And say you've got your DevOps team and they're really interested in Docker and Kubernetes, hey, why don't we give them some Docker training, etc. Um, and one of the key things about this, and it kind of links back to my last point, is um, people should be given time to train. So um, it's great having developers that, that want to train in security that want their developers to be better, but you need to get a little bit of engineering managed buy-in because you obviously will need developers to kind of to, do this training. And with this, it needs to be, you know, well, the, the dream, um, you know, relevant, up to date. Um, it has to vary in complexity. You're going to have senior developers, you're going to have juniors. So you've got to really cater to the individual to keep them as engaged as possible. And then this is another one. So this is a funny story I have from my own personal life. I was on a train a few years ago. I was just going to see my parents, but I was there just on Instagram going through stories. Um, and I see one of my friends who is a um, non-technical, none of my friends are technical, but um, she was working at her uncle's startup, like this fashion design business, da da da, and she, her background was more like PR. And then on this Instagram story, it was a Word document with HTML and JavaScript, and then her little, you know, you can write text, and it was like, oh, coding is so hard. I was like, oh my God. You're literally, um, you're literally changing code in a Word doc. Like, oh my God. So anyway, I like did the nice thing. I DM'd her and like, oh, hey, yeah. So there's a thing called an IDE and here's a screenshot. She's like, wow, that's so cool. Um, I really hope no one out there is doing their day job coding on Word. Um, but hey, when that happened, when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, wow. Um, and that's the thing. Okay, obviously we, we want to have the right IDE, but you also want to have, you know, SAST, DAST, IAS, RAST. But it's not just about the tool, it's also about you know what, what fits in kind of each process and having the right balance of tools and trained people. You also you don't want to have you know lists of problems every Monday and then every Monday that pile goes either into the bin or goes you know to the junk mail folder, etc. So you need to um, you know obviously make sure you use this and also have security, you know, or company policies that can be assessed, adhered to, and updated, etc. And this can help as well with open source libraries if you've got a standard set. It's like, yeah, we're gonna be doing everything on on Django and Python or say like Angular and then at least people know you know what to stick to. I think this is my last um, my last tip. Um, so it's a bit cliche, the best DevSecOps dev teams keep it real with each other and the importance about this, each team understands each other's roles and responsibilities. Um, one of my favorite Harvard Business Review articles, I read it when I was about 23, it really like changed my life, um, but great managers play chess not checkers where in checkers you cheat each piece individually to win the game chess you have to understand each piece the quirks the everything in order to win the game and that's the thing development and you're not trying to make developer into security and i'm pretty sure you're not trying to make security into development so you need to understand the roles responsibilities um, and ultimately you're working with the same tools um, and in complete, ugh, completing the same outcomes so really you need everyone to treat each other you know, with respect, a collaborative environment, having the culture, and having a process training and tools that enhances, not impedes, your security aware developer. Um, and having just a safe space to understand each other's challenges. Um, I went to a talk a few years ago, um, it was a Google SRE, and they compared it to changing a car wheel like you know, F1 um, at about 200 million miles an hour. And what if they had an incident, because obviously they happen, um, they would afterwards have a little you know, session, be like, okay, what went wrong? What can we learn from it? And she was like, oh yeah, this was, sorry, this was me. And it was actually quite a big thing, but no one ever blamed her that you know, the whole team learned from the experience. 
So building for developers. Uh, like I say, I, I, I was one. I still do a little bit here and there. So hopefully I can speak a little bit. Um, so let's look into the mind of a developer. And you know, what do we like? So we tend to like things online, um, whether that's, um, you know, say video games, whether it's communicating with each other, whether it's obviously doing our day job. The, the internet has kind of revolutionized um, not only developers, but kind of the world. So having something online is usually a, a, you know, a great starting point. Um, hands on. So there's a bit of research around types of learning, you know, kinesthetic, which is learning by doing, visual, which is either, you know, colors, graphs, or you can also have visual verbal, which is reading, and then audio, which is uh, what you hear. And everyone's going to be a mix of both. But what I discovered in my last job, uh, I think there were about 17 SEs that kind of did my role. And I think about 14 of them were kinesthetic. They like hands on and you can sometimes tell by the language people use in terms of if they want to get to grips with something and break it and, you know, have a go and, you know, all, all this, or do they prefer to hear about it or do they prefer to read? And in general, developers tend to be uh, more hands on. Obviously, everyone's a mix and everyone's different. But anyway. um, gamified is always good. Um, I remember once being in a job interview and it was quite a it was a job interview with a managing director and they were kind of wanting to get to know me and it was got quite deep at one point but it was like what do you remember of your um childhood and i'm like playing playstation one honestly um i would done a lot of hours i recently got a ps4 i kind of missed the middle stage or i had a ps2 but anyway um we like gamified approaches oh is that xp available can we level up uh, are there points? Um, you know, oh, is there a hint system? Do I have to pay for it or does it come free? Oh, oh, what's what's going on? So um, gamified approaches uh, tend to really resonate. There's a lot of neuroscience around that as well. So it can be to do with um, the dopamine as well. Um, insights and data, always good to get an introspective look at yourself. What am I good at? What am I bad at? Maybe I'm great at injection. Um, maybe I'm not so good at, um, you know, sensitive data exposure. I accidentally put an API key and then, you know, uh, commented everything out and kept it in there. I'm not going to say that's a true story, but anyway. Um, and another thing, self-paced. Developers write be, like being told what to do. They might be told they need an outcome, but, you know, you can be process or outcome focused. And it's like, yeah, we need to get this done in the next month or ideally, you know, today or whatever it is. But giving developers the ability, especially with training, to access it at their own pace. You know, some people like to do things at three in the morning. Some people are insomniac. I used to find when I was at uni, my most productive hours were between uh, 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. Um, so it's all about having that self-paced environment and ultimately tailored. And I kind of touched on this. Don't give your mobile developers Java content. You know, if you have one team on, on COBOL, great. Give them the COBOL content, but don't fry everyone else's brains. Um, so, um, conclusion, I hope this has been uh, useful. Um, I kind of talked a little bit about, you know, some obviously high profile incidents, you know, all related to OWASP, a little bit about uh, software creation, um, different methodologies, waterfall, agile, DevOps, DevSecOps, and then moving into uh, the DevSec security aware developers, and then some top tips, a tactical guide. So, I hope you have enjoyed. I'm going to pause now if there have been any um, questions and hope you've enjoyed my session. It's been a wonderful session, Stephanie. Stefania, sorry. Thank you very much. And actually, there are a few questions from our YouTube live chat. It's mm -hmm. most of them are only from one person, uh, Rengen. And he wants to know that the, how, how do you remove all the Gacy software and replace it with a new one? Sorry, I just cut out. How do I remove all what? Sorry? All leg legacy software and replace oh. it with a new one. Um, so it depends what you have. Um, I spoke to a uh, software, um, it was more of a startup, and their legacy, their legacy was PHP which I've worked in other organizations, that's the norm. They were using some funky stuff like Dart and Flutter. Um, so, and, and most people, when they mean legacy, they can mean languages such as C, because that's been around a while. Or you can go even further back, maybe it's COBOL, Fortran, you know, uh, kind of more machine languages, etc. So I think the best way is to assess. But the first things first is, you know, okay, you know you've got legacy. It's like, okay, what does it do? You know, how much do I have? How necessary, you know, are these functionalities? And what would a replacement look like? And then by first, the first thing important is, is to understand what is legacy? You know, um, 
what is it doing? And then you can start an approach to refactor. Um, I worked at a company when I was doing Python development. Thank God I joined when I did because about a year before they had just refactored all their code base moving from Perl to Python. Uh, both scripting languages. I wasn't involved in that. It, by the time I joined, I was okay. Um, but it's really about understanding um, what the legacy does, and then you know assessing the, the need, the requirement, and then prioritizing the move across. I'm not going to say it'll be an easy job, or actually, it depends how much you have. If it's just one class, then then yeah. But I think for most organizations, it is a lot. So it's just about really understanding what that looks like, and then creating the business case, and then uh, you know working. Um, working towards that. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, let's say if uh, within the uh, replacement of the software, there's huge inertia and the old software is, even if it is unperformant and insecure, but it delivers the uh, to the actors of the, it delivers value to the actors of the business. And how do you think you, we can approach uh, to find That's that inertia? <laughs> That's such a tricky one because I know there's probably so many organizations and so many users with that exact use case. It's like, we've got this legacy, we know it's bad, there's a bit in there, it's not great, uh, but it's providing value. So then it's really about assessing the risk. Um, for example, um, I know within open source, there's a thing called the CVSS calculator, and it takes into account, you know, how are you accessing the this vulnerability? Uh, you know, how, how are you accessing, how is this attack vector access? So, you know, do I, can I just access it online? Do I need to be hardwired into the system? Um, you know, in terms of credentials, can anyone do it? Do I need an admin password? And then you can start to create a, it's called a CVSS, it's a score out of 10. Um, I'm not saying do that for for the for the you know, legacy because that's more open source. But you know it would have to be a trade off because I 100% get it. There are going to be systems out there that are provide that are nece you know necessary. But then you have to start to think about the implications. It's like okay, we obviously can't just shut it down. Um, but what happens if we get hacked? What does that look like? Because obviously there's not only the implication of losing sensitive data. Um, you know, um, you know, names, credit cards, user data, etc. There's also the brand uh, represent uh, if image. So I think Equifax lost one third of their market cap. It was about five billion, um, and everyone you know has heard heard of them. So they've obviously done a lot of uh, PR fixing it. But um, it, you you really have to do kind of a, a risk assessment. I totally understand your legacy stuff is probably doing important things, but you need to, especially if it's if there are known issues, you might want to prioritize that just because, well, yeah, on the flip side, okay, what happens if you get hacked? Um, and then ask, ask that question to yourself. Great, great, great. Um, just let me pick on that one chart that you had regarding the 85% of mm -hmm. problems are appearing with the coding phase. Mm -hmm. um, are you actually here referring to the um, to the writing of code or yeah. is it more to the circumstances that we have to deal with dependencies and third party libraries? So it can be both. At that stage it was coding. So a developer doing their day job will include dependencies. Um, so, for example, they will, you know, they're probably going to be working on a framework such as, um, you know, Strut, Spring, um, Angular, Node, all, all of the common ones. And guess what? Those are all open source. Um, so even just doing their day job, writing code within their IDE, that I would be very surprised if there's a single developer out there that hasn't at least been exposed to open source. So uh, within the coding, those defects, it can be either you know, they write an accidental line that is unsafe, like my SQL injection, the parameterized query. Or the second is they introduce a, you know, in, in software composition, some, bleh, software composition analysis, there's something called typo squatting. And say instead of Django, I put Django, like two O's on the end. You know, an easy mistake, you know, common happen. But guess what? Some malicious actor has taken Django and then has inserted loads of malware or um, you know um, crypto miners or something like that. And it's a totally innocent mistake by a developer. They might have just not been concentrating. It might have haven't had enough copy or something like that. But that can obviously introduce vulnerabilities. So any anything where the developer is involved, either coding themselves or introducing vulnerabilities. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, then we have another question from YouTube chat and. He wants to know that uh, actually he's saying that he doesn't think that 
Unit testing does not have fine security issues. Other form of testing uh, may do that. What's your position on this? Yeah, so I think, um, I don't know, my opinion is secure. It's a bit like an onion. Or I saw a really helpful talk a while ago uh, that helped when I was quite junior that helped to explain it. So say you have a gold bar in your house and you have a gate um, and then you've locked the gate. But what happens? Someone jumps the gate. It's like, oh, I didn't lock my house or I didn't put it in a safe. So security in this example, you would have you put your gold bar in a safe, you lock your house, you lock your windows, you have your gate, you have a guard dog, you have someone patrolling security, you know, security man patrolling the, the perimeter the whole day. So it's really about this multi-level approach. So a bit like the question, unit testing isn't great. Like, OK, it's, it's a little band-aid. It, it can help. But actually, uh, stuff like software composition analysis, uh, sorry, static uh, code analysis, so looking for the code for vulnerabilities, uh, software composition analysis, looking at dynamic static testing as well. These are all layers to the onion that can really help because if you're only doing unit testing, mm, I don't know, you, you might have some gaps. So it's best to have a multi um, faceted approach. And when you can, shift left. So whether that's in the IDEs, um, also in the developer's brain, so that can be done um, via security training as well. All right, great, great, great. Um, I think one last final question. Mm -hmm. And how would you actually initiate the process to to wake up the the security sense in a team of developers? database admins, system admins, and uh, secondly, how would you deal with people that are not open to that change or that say, okay, I've done this all my years, uh, I'm not changing, kind of refusing this kind of, you know, um, change into towards um, a more whole view and integrating security. Sure. So I, I, I get 100% what you mean. And this really comes down to my culture slide, the little triangle. Um, and what you've described is kind of the beginning of a bottom up approach. So, you know, I might be interested, but I think there's going to be a lot of pushback either from senior, from my cohorts, from wherever. Um, and there's a couple of things you can do, like as an individual, you know, if you want to start the security flag in your company, um, there's a lot of free tools out there. And the reason I say that is because you as, as someone can just, just dip the toe in the water. Um, so I know OWASP has some uh, really good, um, you know, tools out there. You can do OWASP deck checker. So that will check your dependencies that you're using. Um, I think there's like, there's OWASP literally have a whole range of different tools. You can, um, you know, hey, maybe download a trial license for other app tools. And you can just look at your code base and just have a look because um, the people who are like, yeah, we've always done it this way, it's always been fine. It's like what I said, oh yeah, and 15 years ago, mobile wasn't a thing and, and now it is. Um, so sometimes when people have that, that mindset, it can be tricky because you can't force someone to change. Um, but you um, you can obviously kind of encourage it. So if it was me, uh, yeah, what I would do, check out some of the free tools out there, a little bit of advertising. Hey, Secure Code Warrior, if you want to try security training, we have free website trials and it's fun and gamified. Um, but um, you can, um, uh, what do you call it? You can start to investigate and create a business case because, for example, if you do, uh, you know, OWASP depth check, for example, and you find that you're you've got loads of, you know, unsafe vulnerabilities, and then hey, you can email me. I'll give you I'll give you some hints. But there are lots of companies say Equifax. It was a bad vulnerability. Then. I'm sure there'll be someone in the organization, even if it's you know as high as the CEO or someone in PR, it's like, we have the same problems that happened to Equifax or to, or to another hack. Um, you know, we need to change this. So from a personal level, I you can you know start your own exploring. And then what you might find is as your code quality improves, at least your peers, they might be like, oh, what are you doing? That looks fun. Or, oh, you mean that will help my build not fail, etc." So I, I appreciate you know what you must be going through because you know it's it's hard um but it's just about you know being perseverant and starting you know investigating um you know what can be done all right 
thank you so much, mm -hmm. Stefania, for your time. That was a really great insight. Also then getting the idea about um, how existing teams, how existing code base um, can be inspected, how this sense for security can be woken up in a team. And um, yeah, it was great having you. I hope you had some fun time as well with us. Uh, Due to the pandemic, unfortunately, it did not, um, um, you know, work towards a visit here of the of the tropical island of Mauritius. But you never know how the changes, how the conditions are changing in the next few months. Um, it would be great, maybe, to welcome you um, in one of our future events. Um, then here in Mauritius, that you can, apart from the. Um, sunny days <laughs> in, in, in London that you might also be able to enjoy the sandy beaches and the ocean here in Mauritius. Oh, thank you so much. I look forward to it. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Bye for now.